Civil rights, uh, people whose lives uh, reflect movement, success, uh, the struggle uh, in a variety of ways. And I'm pleased to have as a guest today a friend and elder in the community. Elder. Elder in the community. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> Melvin Carter, Jr., Melvin Carter II. Uh, but first, let me uh, say that this program is brought to you by Comcast in or of the Twin Cities, and we're glad to have them on board as a sponsor. You know, Melvin, I'm just talking to people in the community about what the word civil rights means, the words mean to you, and how does the notion of civil rights uh, show up in your personal life? When were you conscious of civil rights as a concept and how it impacted you? Uh, secondly, how this idea of the civil rights of our people, our struggle, the movement, uh, how did that show up in your family? You're thinking about your mom and your dad and your grands, uh, the move of your people from, I think, Texas, right? Man, um, you read your homework, huh? <laughs> so, And just the challenges you had at family. And then finally, when you think of civil rights and your particular investment, your role, your calling uh, as a uh, servant, as a leader, as a law enforcement officer, as a career police officer, uh, as you execute the duty of being a protector of the peace and servant of the community, how is this notion of civil rights guiding and shaping? I'm how smirking you because there's a whole lot in there, man. We got a lot to talk about in just, mean, in just I mean, a few minutes. Okay, so so anyway, <laughs> I, I'm hung up on the fact that people say human uh, civil rights when I'm thinking human rights, yes. human dignity, and I, I don't I don't understand why we don't say human rights. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, they first came to my attention when I was perhaps denied some some civil or human rights and denied some human dignity, you know, and uh, in, in, in various forms, and it, it shapes, it, same, it changes shape and form as we seek to st survive and thrive and equalize as human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, when um, the times that they it's manifested as obstacles to me, it's always been time to go bare knuckle. <laughs> and fight uh -huh. and work, you know. And there's a time to work and time to fight, and sometimes they're the same, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. If you, people say I'm gonna fight for this and fight for that, sometimes they say that, and and that can mean any old thing. But if you ain't willing to to work for something, I think there's no sense in fighting for it. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't. You, you know, Martin Luther King said, "A man who hasn't found a purpose for which to die ain't fit to live." And if you haven't lived for something, you can't die for it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but. You know, um, and then you use the term law enforcement officer. You know, I tell these young guys that, that are police officers going into peace work, that any time you hear that term law mm -hmm. enforcement, you got to wash your mouth out with soap. Uh. You know, because the work is peace work. Mm -hmm. I took my oath as a peace officer mm -hmm. and went into police work. Law enforcement is just a sliver of the pie of the peace mission, mm -hmm. you know. Um, when you're rescuing people and uh, finding kids and... Uh, um, and, and, and serving people, you know, law enforcement is probably, I, I'd say 15 to 20 percent of the, of the peace mission, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the term law enforcement implies force. Mm -hmm. It implies suppression, mm -hmm. and which implies oppression, you know, and it, and it casts us in an us-against-them perspective. My family came here in 1915, 16. My father's family, but he already had some uncles here, and they were pretty, they were pretty serious cats. Do you know about mm -hmm. them? Tell me. Uncle Mac and Uncle Uncle Foster. These guys were buying a property up and down Rondo in the first place, and and they were they, they ran on the road, and the road that they ran on was called the Empire Builder, which went up north and curved up in, in north into Canada during Prohibition. The railroads, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so guess what they were stockpiling on the trains up mm -hmm. there in Canada, L? Well. The Prohibition. Come on. Booze. Come on. Liquor. Come yeah, on. That's right, sure. That was, that <laughs> and was the business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my uncles, you know, I mean, these cats, was, they had their own little credit union. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting because um, there's a whole lot of reasons why we don't chronicle our mission because, you know, my dad warned us before he died, like, a year or two, he said, Melvin, I know you're writing about your autobiography, but if you write about, you know, uh, what, what I'm telling you about now, he said, that can come back and haunt you even still to this day. Uh -huh. You know, so we had a lot of things back in our past that um, we don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the stuff we're not proud of, 
Some of it was dehuman, dehuman, de say the word for me, dehumanizing, dehumanizing right, right. And, and some of it may not be absolutely legal, mm -hmm. but um, it's our track, it's mm -hmm. our journey. And I think I expose some stuff on, in my book that not real flattering about myself, mm -hmm. some things mm -hmm. that um, <laughs> characterize some real flaws. But I took that risk because my main target are the young brothers that come behind us. They need to know that we struggle. They need to know that we, we fought. They need to know that we worked. They need to know that we kicked some butt and we took some butt whoopings. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a great deal of value in just not uh, self-destructing. If you cannot destruct yourself and destroy anybody else and stay alive and figure out which way is up and go forward and stumble and fall, moving forward, you got something going on. It means a lot. It means a lot. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland, our special uh, daily webcast here from the Marcus Garvey House in North Minneapolis. And if you're watching this online, uh, thank you for joining us. I see uh, Louis Moore is watching. Louis, thank you. Hey, and I, I see uh, Bessie Pierce is watching, and Patricia Ann is watching from Florida. So uh, thank you. Louis says, preach, uh, Melvin. Uh, this is Louis from the Major Taylor. Uh, bicycle Club. So, Louis, thank you for watching. And thank he's you, Louis. saying you're preaching, and that's what we have to do. But to you who are watching this, uh, we want you to like this program. If you like the content we're creating here, like it. We'd like you to share it, and we'd like you also to follow us. We want to grow this audience and grow this conversation. Our goal here is to create a space where we can talk about issues, tell stories, uh, do the truth telling that's necessary, and reveal the inner workings of things. Uh, there's so much that we have done, that we are doing, that we've come through. And too often, unless we are in a position to make uh, memorializing that truth uh, available and accessible to the rest of us for a long period of time, it will be forgotten. It will be as though it never happened. You've done that with Diesel Heart. Talk about this book. It's a wonderful, I, I haven't read it, I'm going to read it, but I've been told it's a powerful and passionate uh, exploration of your life and your story. Tell I, me about I, it. I've always been in awe of my story. I'm going to ask my readers to believe some stuff that I wouldn't believe myself <laughs> had I not been, had I, had I not lived it. Now, what is the question? The question is uh, why I wrote it, and maybe how I survived these long years and survived uh, so many situations mm -hmm. and incidents and came out relatively similarly unscathed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and maybe the reason that I was allowed to do this is to write this book, to chronicalize so many stories, so many brothers and sisters that were way more talented than I was, way more gifted, faster, more athletic, way more dynamic. And, and, and um, I, I felt the urge to chronicalize and tell this story. And you know, what I, what I meant to say that I never finished speaking on was that my Uncle Mac and my Uncle Foster when, when my father's family had to flee Paris, Texas, for because the, the town burned down, mm -hmm. Uncle Mac sent for my the Carters, my dad, Uncle, mm -hmm. my dad, Mim and Mary, and, and my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And um, guess where they moved to? Rondo, right? Rondo, yeah, baby. Yeah. And that's where my uncle and them had bought all that property up. Okay. So you know what happened? Mm -hmm. in, two, in the year 1936, on the St. Paul official formal map, that area that they were investing in, their, their method of passing down wealth to the next generation mm -hmm. was, was, was on the formal map blotted out as the Negro slums. Okay. That's what it said. Yeah. So imagine what that did to the property value. Mm -hmm. you know, they already attacked it. Mm -hmm. you know, and then by the time we...